speaking to us in an exclusive international broadcast interview. Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong joins us live from Adelaide. Now, Minister of the World, and especially us here in Asia, are following this AUKUS submarine deal very closely because it has potential implications for us. Now, the wider worry is the precedent it sets when it comes to nuclear non-proliferation, as expressed by countries like China, Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, how will Australia reassure your neighbours about this? Well, first, by making sure we uh, acquire this capability very transparently. And we, we have provided briefings. We will provide more briefings. We will continue to talk with at the region and listen to the region about any concerns they, they may have. I want to start by saying what you yourself said in the recap uh, before we, I, I came on, which is we Australia will never seek to acquire nuclear weapons. We do not seek that nuclear capability. What we are seeking to do is to replace an existing and ageing submarine capability with a new capability, which is nuclear propulsion, very different to nuclear armed. Uh, I would also talk about our motivation. You know, we're a middle power, uh, like most of the many of the countries of the Medan region. Uh, we don't seek to acquire this capability to do anything other than to seek to bat ensure a strategic equilibrium. We seek to acquire this capability in order to help keep the peace. We want a peaceful, stable, prosperous region as Singapore, uh, as Malaysia, as Indonesia does. And we want a region that is respectful of sovereignty. And all of our capability, which in the scheme of things in the Indo-Pacific is not uh, by, any, by any means a substantial capability, uh, we want all of our capability, diplomatic and strategic, directed to this end. Oh, Minister, China's mission to the UN, though, just released a statement criticizing the deal, saying it is a blatant act that it hurts peace and stability in the region. So, yes, AUKUS is seen as a deterrent to China's growing ambition in this region, in the Indo-Pacific, the South China Sea. Others, though, say this deal may contribute to a dangerous rise in military tensions with China. So, Minister, what is the risk of a greater Australian defence capability proving destabilising instead of stabilising in this region? Well, I again go back to uh, why we are uh, seeking this capability, which is to contribute to what I've described as a strategic equilibrium. We want a region where no single country uh, is dominated, no single country dominates. We want a, a region which is peaceful, stable and secure, and we will always uh, work to that end, whether it's this capability, our economic engagement or our diplomatic capability. And, you know, I, I, what I would say is uh, people can judge um, this government and this uh, and Australia by how we have operated in the region. And I think people will see, you know, we, we are not a country that is seeking to escalate. In fact, uh, I and others have called for, in terms of the great powers, that we were, we've urged that there be guardrails uh, to, around the competition between the great powers. You know, we have been a voice uh, in support of the great powers managing their competition wisely. And I think that's consistent with uh, much of the uh, ASEAN region. Uh, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has said that competition requires dialogue and diplomacy. And Defence Minister mm. Richard Miles today also saying Australia has offered to brief China about the deal. Have we got any response from Beijing yet? And what are you hoping the response will be? Oh, yes. Uh, when I spoke to um, for the, the new foreign minister, Chingang, in um, Delhi, I offered to I offered a briefing and I'm sure uh, that, you know, we will uh, uh, be able to make uh, give further information to our, our Chinese uh, counterparts uh, and we, we're happy to do so. But uh, can I go back to the beginning of your question? Because I think that's a very good introduction and that is um, dialogue. Uh, we were very pleased that President Biden put on the table guardrails and increased dialogue uh, prior to his meeting uh, last year with President Xi. Uh, we would continue to encourage that. I think the region uh, would hope and expect that the, great, that the great powers manage their competition wisely, put in place guardrails to ensure that there is not escalation, 
put in place frameworks to ensure there is not miscalculation. Uh, you know, Australia obviously, uh, you know, is a US ally. There are many others in the region who are not, but we do share a very clear view about the importance of competition being managed, regardless of you know which where, where we come from. And Chinese President Xi Jinping, as you know, has secured a third term. And the trajectory of his first two terms, largely tackling corruption, Belt and Road, then eliminating poverty, raising per capita GDP, and then COVID-19 came. And now, given geopolitical tensions and poor relations with the West, he is very laser-focused on what he says is marrying development and security and pledging to build his military into a great wall of steel to defend China's interests, and one of which is to reunite with Taiwan by 2020. So, to what extent, Minister, are you concerned that alliances like AUKUS and the Quad are driving or could drive a regional arms race that could lead to warfare in Asia? And if that happens, what would Australia do in such a situation? Well, first, uh, the, the nub of your question appears to be that uh, the engagement between partner nations such as the Quad, so including India, uh, and Japan, as well as Australia and the US, that that engagement, which really is focused on peace and stability, is somehow escalatory. And I, look, I, I don't accept that, and I actually don't think the region believes that. Uh, we are being very transparent uh, about what we seek. We are being very transparent about what we were do what we are doing, uh, and we are clear uh, as a you know, smaller power. Um, that we want to be part of a region where you know, great powers don't uh, simply dominate. We want to be part of a region where sovereignty is respected. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the lessons of Russia and Ukraine is we have to keep striving for an international order and a regional order in which sovereignty of all is protected. Uh, and that's the approach Australia takes. And I actually think that is the same sort of aspiration that countries, which might be from different perspectives, but it's actually the same um, objective that so many countries of the region want, stability, prosperity, peace, and the respect of sovereignty. And Minister, let's look a bit more closely at current China-Australia relations. How will Canberra balance this long-term military strategy with its economic imperatives, which at the moment involve repairing and restoring trade relations with Beijing, which is your largest trading partner? Mm, it is. Well, look, what, what we said to China and, and to, uh, to um, the Chinese ministers with whom we've engaged, including on my visit to Beijing, uh, is that we think it's in their interests, their country's interests, their people's interests as well, as well as Australia's, uh, to remove those trade impediments. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, said uh, we believe it is possible for us to continue to grow our bilateral relationship if we managers manage our differences wisely. Now, we seek to manage those differences wisely. We, we, we seek to be clear about where our national interests lie, what our national interests are, and to make our sovereign decisions about them. But to engage in a way that is respectful, uh, recognises that China has its set of interests, that we will engage around both our national interests and we will seek to resolve differences which will inevitably arise wisely. But on the, the trade point, I'd again reiterate, uh, we believe it is in both countries' interests for those trade impediments to be removed. And looking at North Korea, Minister Pyongyang fired two short-range ballistic missiles this morning. And you met with your Quad counterparts earlier this month in New Delhi. And one area of focus was Pyongyang's aggression and threats. Uh, what is your view on South Korea's plan to step up engagement with the Quad? And what would the implications of this be for bolstering regional security? <laughs> Well, as, as we know, North Korea is, is a rogue state uh, and has, despite you know, really widespread, virtually universal condemnation of its behaviours, continued down a very destabilising path, which is destabilising for the region. And what is destabilising for our region is ultimately destabilising for the world. So continuing to uh, ensure that we have... Uh, alliances, partnerships uh, between nations to reinforce stability 
uh, is important in the face of, of the sorts of behaviours uh, that we have seen over and over again from the North Korean regime. Uh, Minister Australia also hosting the next Court Leader Summit in Sydney later this year. What can we expect from this? <laughs> well, we can talk again after that. But look, I, I think the Quad is really strengthening and uh, it's strengthening in a way that looks to how it is uh, that we can create a, a stronger and more stable region. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, People describe it in strategic terms. It also uh, has a role in many of the, as, as my friend uh, Jashanka, External Affairs Minister of India Jashanka talks about, you know, the, the, the delivery of public goods, that is things of common benefit to the, to the region. And uh, the humanitarian and disaster relief is one area where working, we are working uh, to cooperate more closely. So look, uh, what I'd say is uh, I, I think that arrangement uh, has been a very important development over these last years. It's a very good dialogue from countries of the region towards stability uh, and common benefit. And for Australia, it works alongside uh, our commitment to ASEAN, which holds the centre of the region. Uh, and ASEAN centrality, as you know, uh, is so important uh, to the architecture of the region in which we live. And let's pick up on that point about ASEAN Minister. Looking at Southeast Asia, the region is one of Australia's vital trade partners. And last year in Singapore, you said the greatest trade and economic opportunities for Australia over the next 30 years lie in the ASEAN region. In which key sectors that marry well right. with Australian capabilities are you most keen to strengthen engagement as Australia works towards your 2040 strategy? Mm. Uh, look, that's a good question, and and you know there are, I could give you a range of answers. I could talk about our you know twenty fifty um, net zero strategy and how we are uh, wanting to shift uh, what is a very energy intensive economy, emissions intensive economy, to becoming a clean energy superpower, and the the opportunities to the region. But can I answer it in this way? When I came to office in in, in this role. Uh, uh, I was very clear that I wanted to increase Australia's economic engagement uh, with the ASEAN region. Now, I know we're not uh, a market of the size of China's. We're not a, we don't have the investment capacity the United States have. But, you know, we have certain sectors where we are uh, you know, world leaders in. So I, I asked Nicholas Moore, who's the former CEO of Macquarie Bank, probably very well known to many of your viewers uh, as an entity because it's obviously got such a large economic footprint in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I've asked him to be my ASEAN envoy, the government's ASEAN envoy, and I've asked him to craft the ASEAN economic strategy for Australia. And so I hope to get that report soon and I hope what we will be able to do as a consequence of that report is to really lift uh, and leverage Australia's strengths in terms of our economic engagement with the region. Because as you point out, if you look at economic growth, economic potential, population growth between now and 2030 and 2040, ASEAN is the key. We've always known it's the centre of the region. We committed to that, but it will become even more economically powerful uh, uh, in, the, in the years and decades ahead. All right, Minister, thank you very much for joining us. That was Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong, live from Adelaide. And that was an exclusive international broadcast interview for CNA as well.